Anyway, Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, we are so glad those that can join us on live stream. Of course, the people on live stream get to see all the mistakes that I make before I ever publish a video. Uh, but the broadcast today, friends, is very serious. And there's some things that the Lord has been revealing to me as I'm writing the book that I'm on right now. Again, I have not revealed the title of the book as of yet. Much of the contents will not be revealed until it's actually published. But this particular issue, I think, is very vital that we get this out to the public as soon as possible. It's a revelation the Lord placed on my heart. And uh, I was actually talking to, talking to Dr. Stephen Pigeon about this the other day. We didn't speak about it on the broadcast. But I really wanted to take the time to share this with you guys here. And all of chapter 10 and, and, and John's gospel here is important. But I'm going to focus on some key issues here that I think have been totally overlooked. And I have multiple uh, pages up as well to share even more in depth with you. So let's get right into it. Starting with chapter 10, verse 7, it says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That's something interesting to keep in mind. And, and you're going to see why in just a few moments. Well, actually, I'll, I'll have to tell you why. I don't think I actually have the screen up for that, but I'll, so I'll have to just tell you about it. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. The wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, <clears throat> I've heard many ministers preach on this over the years, but what I'm going to share with you now, you may already know it. Maybe God's already revealed this to you as well, but it was a shock to me, and we're going to go in depth on this. Uh, this really, I think, is going to get you, get you really thinking here. First, I want to just deal with one issue that's right up here at the beginning. Yeshua says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That's a very interesting point. And I say that because there's a new movement right now going on where a couple of authors, and I forget their names right now, uh, but they have began a movement based on the Dead Sea Scrolls claiming that there was another man about 50 years before Jesus that was very much like the Messiah. Now, I might argue that the fact on this, is stating that the writings probably refer actually to Yeshua himself. They've just misdated the information. Um, but nonetheless, they're trying to downplay Jesus, that there was actually another man that was a Messiah. Uh, but what's interesting is that when you look at the words of Jesus that John recorded here, even if this were to be the case, or no doubt others even before that that claimed to be the Mashiach that was coming because we had hundreds of years that had come along before, since the prophecy was made by Moses that the Lord thy God would raise up a prophet likened unto him. Now, some rabbis argue that that's not the Messiah, but there are rabbis that argue that that is the Messiah that is spoken of of Daniel's prophecy. All right? But, it's going to get interesting, friends. There are, uh, but it, what's interesting to me, though, is that Jesus actually deals with it in a very interesting way. He says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And that's a good point. Because the one shepherd that has been listened to for the last 2,000 years is not whoever they want to write about that may have been considered a Messiah before, but never was. 
never followed the shepherd or never followed, yeah, the good shepherd. They didn't follow Christ's teachings to begin with. Now, that's not what we're getting into tonight. I just happened to catch that before I was going to bring this out to you guys. Uh, though anybody that knows anything about the messiahs, though, uh, Israel has had a, probably a dozen messiahs since the time of Christ that they believe to have been the messiah uh, or claimed to be a messiah to begin with. So that's nothing new either. In fact, uh, Menachem um, uh, of the Chabad organization was the last one that they believed was the Messiah. Uh, but let's get, let's get more into what I actually wanted to speak to you guys about. I am the door. Be, uh, by me, if any man enter in, he shall, be, uh, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief, here's where he gets at it. The thief cometh not but, to, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Mm. which kind of makes me think that he's referring to the Romans. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. All right. But he's prophesying in verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. So who was the one that actually came, who stole, who killed and destroyed? It was Titus, the Roman general. All right. So we know it's Rome. Now, when it comes to Christ, when he says he'll lay down his life, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Again, it was the Roman government that put Christ to death. So keep this in mind. All right, we're setting a stage, but you know, the biggest problem is going to be, is going to be the hireling. That's what we're going to get into in just a moment. All right, but I wanted to point those facts out there. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. All right. Now, let me, let's just go up. I didn't pull this up in time. Let me put it up. Ark of Titus. I got my own pictures of this, but I just want to make sure that you guys can see this as well. All right. Here we go. The Ark of Titus right here. This is commemorating. Get this picture a little bit better here. Oh, can't see it very well there. Uh, well, can't see any of those very well, can you? Uh, let's see if we can get to the one of their sites there. Just, ah, it's not good either. Wikipedia. Um, here we go. That's much better. This is where Rome under uh, Titus, when they come, they ransack the city. They destroyed the city. They killed the people that were there. They killed many of the prophets. Uh, our apostles, I should say, that died under the Roman persecution. And as well, they stole everything, as we see in the, the particular image here that bears that information uh, that's in Rome today. I've been there myself, photographed it myself, have many photographs of that. So as the scripture says, the thief cometh not. He doesn't come for anything else but for to steal, stole all the temple treasures, to kill, killed all the the Jews that were there, as many as they could, and to destroy. And he destroyed the temple and the sanctuary and the, and the city of Jerusalem, burnt it to the ground. Right? He says, I come that I might have life. Or excuse me, that, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See the big difference? And look at all the crusades that Rome did afterwards as well. You know, they, you know the, the Catholic Church could say, well, the Roman government is not the Catholic Church. But after the Vatican, after 325 A.D. at Nicaea there, and they made church and state one, then later we ended up with the Crusades, and then the Catholic Church was making sure that the government carried out its bidding, killing anybody and anything that didn't agree with them, as well as the Vatican, according to Alberta Rivera, made a created the Muslim religion, which the Sunnis are the ones that are still loyal to the Vatican to this day. And it was creating, according to Alberta Rivera, that quoted Cardinal Bia from the Vatican, that it was created for the purpose of stomping out the true Christians that were believing Jews and believing children of the house of Israel that were all through northern Africa and in Syria. Remember how Paul was going to go to Damascus on his road there? That's why I go into this issue so much on Israeli News Live about uh, the situation in Syria. It's not just the mothers of Israel. Even the matriarch, Rebecca, is a Syrian. But no, there's people out there that just promote the idea of destroying Syria. 
They totally forget the covenant that Laban made with Jacob. Anyway, that's not the time for this right now. So let's move on, though. So we see, he says, I am, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, and of course, is killed by the Roman government. As I said, though, Rome did go and they did the Crusades. They've been involved in practically every war that has ever happened. They have been collaborators. They were collaborators with the neo-Nazis. And even now, the Vatican meeting with Erdogan, giving the guy a peace prize while he goes back and kills all the Kurds over in northern Syria. You know, this is a Roman war going on. They are trying to reestablish re the Babylonian Empire. All right? Let's get, let's, I'm sorry, I've I got so much on my mind, I can't even get into this right. Verse 12, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scat, uh, scattereth the sheep. You know what a hireling is? I mean, I really look at this, uh, what Jesus says here, as a two-fold fulfillment in prophecy. Because as we look at Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61, Yeshua takes, when, he, when the priest hands him the scroll in the temple or in the synagogue where he's at, and he takes the scroll and he begins to read, the, the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me. He's, uh, I'm just paraphrasing. He's, he's pre called me to preach the acceptable year, bring good tidings. And then he cuts off in half of verse 2 and closes the book, says, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He doesn't read the other half. And the reason being is because it applies to judgment that he brings his second time around. Now, I say this because what are we dealing with here? Rome, this is a compound fulfillment in prophecy right here. At the time of 70 AD, the Romans came against Israel. And also at Nicaea, Rome, they were beginning to fall away from their first love. The first teaching of Yeshua and the apostles. This is how they were able to make that covenant. This is what caused the collapse of Israel. But when it says a hireling, that's a hired hand, in other words. That is a minister that is paid. And today we have a lot of hirelings out there that are not willing to warn the sheep that the wolf is coming. Now, we get the old saying, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing. Let me show you what a wolf's in sheep, what a wolf really is. Here's something that's really interesting. Romulus and Remus. Anybody ever read anything about Romulus and Remus? This is, this is one reason why. Have you ever seen this image here? This is actually one of the museums there around the Vatican. This is the wolf right here. And you'll see the image everywhere around Vatican City in Rome, Italy. You'll see it on the garbage cans. You'll see it on statues. I, I, I took several pictures while I was in uh, the different museums around the Vatican there of wolves. At first, I didn't know what kind of dog it was. I didn't realize it was a wolf. I'm like, what is this dog? What do they have a statues of dogs in here for and I saw this one as well this very one right here and I photographed it all right and this is Romulus and Remus that are nursing on this wolf and they're the founders of Rome all right now let's look at real quick what the article says about them though all right it says here Nevertheless, Rhea Silvia gave birth to twins, Romulus and Remus, whose father was thought to be Mars, the god of war. Might explain why Rome is, was so bent on the Crusades, right? Amelius, different person altogether, imprisoned the daughter and condemned the babies to death by drowning in the river. Sorry about that. Um the river Tabir. However, the servant in charge of the task took pity on them and instead placed the twins into a basket and pushed them down the river Tabir. They were safely carried to the area of the seven hills, which is Rome. There the boys were found by a she-wolf called Lupa who nursed them in her lair in Pal uh, Palatine Hill until they were found by a shepherd and his wife who raised them as shepherds. That's interesting. Maybe that's where we get the expression, a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
As adults, Romulus, Romulus and Remus were two natural born leaders and in a fight killed King Amulius and reinstated Nimitor as king of Alba Longa. Seeking to establish their own settlement, Romulus finally built a wall around Palestine, Palatine Hill, the location he had chosen for the founding of Rome. Maybe that's how we ended up with the word Palestine in the Middle East. I, I don't know, just the thought I'm throwing out there. Uh, but anyway, here's another thing that's interesting. Then I run across this article. Smart news. Wolf pup spotted near Rome for the first time in decades. That's interesting. The animals were once hunted to a brink of extinction, but are now recovering. Ancient Romans believed that their great city owned its owed its existence, at least in part, to a kindly she-wolf. According to the myth, Romulus and Remus who would go on to establish Rome, were suckled by a wolf after being left to die as infants. Over the centuries, despite the animal's symbolic significance, wolves were hunted to the brink of extinction. Anyway, the babies were captured on camera at a natural reserve operated by the Italian League for the Protection of Birds just outside the capital city. Footage shows the pups drinking from a watering hole, although, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, and frolicking through undergrowth according to the telegraph. Now, I didn't actually watch the video here, but I'm just curious to see. We'll look at it real quick to see if there's only two of them. Wouldn't that be a kind of a hoot, right? Uh, see if we can get it up, get to here where we can get to see if we have more than one. I see just the one. They use the word pups in here as plural, so I'm assuming there was more than one. We don't know for sure. At least I didn't read it on there. Anyway, that's not really significant in this, so we'll just kind of stop the video at that, but it's just kind of odd, isn't it? Uh, so we go back, we go back to the scripture there. We can see though, symbolically, Rome is a wolf. They're, according to the, whether it be legend or history, whatever, they get this wolf as their symbolism. Now, Rome, the Vatican also, Vatican City try to, tries to claim the eagle as a representative, but historically, it's a wolf. So when Jesus says, and we go back into this again, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And of course the Romans killed him as well. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep or not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolves catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. And it was Rome themselves that captured the sheep and scattered Israel, the house of Judah in 70 AD. Now, here's what's really troubling to me, friends. Here we are in modern days. Israel has come back home to be a nation. I realize, I realize biblical prophecy has to be fulfilled. So when I'm saying what I'm saying, please don't misunderstand me. I know it does. And in that regard there, when Yeshua left the scene, Rome was in control. Yeshua is going to return. We know the Messiah is returning. And as a result, if he's returning as well, the stage has got to be reset again. Rome has got to be in control. And who's going to be in control of the old city? Just like it was in the days of when Jesus was here to start with. There was a, there was a second temple. There's going to be a third temple as well. And Rome will have control of that old city. That's why Resolution 181 that was done back in, what, 1946, I believe it was, that was dividing up Israel into two different states, so that the Vatican would get the old city. This is exactly what Pope Pius XII demanded of Moshe Sharit, the second, uh, he was actually the foreign minister of Israel before they actually became a state. He was already being put into that position there, had already met with Pope Pius XII, and he was guaranteeing that statue for him. Now, Pope, what happens? President Trump, his secret plan leaks, and what does it include? International force over the old city. Going back to that 1993-1994 Shimon Peres, Pope John Paul II secret deal which would give the Vatican the old city, just like Resolution 181 was. 
but the Palestinians get a reward as well. They get East Jerusalem as their capital, and they're going to get their own state, quote unquote, their own state. So Rome gets this other part, setting up a new world order agenda. But here's what gets me, friends. Jesus is prophesying of this day as well. He says, because he says, but he that is a hireling, that paid minister that doesn't have the guts to stand up there and tell you the truth about what Rome is doing. See, he's not the shepherd. His own, the sheep are not. And he seeth the wolf coming. You see Rome coming in to do this very thing in the last days. And what? And he leaveth the sheep. He'll just, he'll tell you anything, tickle your ears instead. This is what got me. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. And look what they've been doing. Look at the different ministers. You got Kenneth Copeland that led the way, bringing the evangelicals and, 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 and many of the others as well, whether it be duress, stress, or whatever the case may be, all ran back and joined Mother Rome. And I guarantee you, they're going to make every, they're going to make it all look good. This thing, oh, the Pope's bringing everything back together. They're going to build. I'm sure the Pope will have a, a big hand in helping in the building of the third temple. He'll play a part in it. Don't worry, he will. It'll make all the evangelicals will just flock to it, flee to it. Why? It'll scatter the sheep. And I say scatter the sheep even in this day. Oh, yes, it will. Because in order to be all this to happen, East Jerusalem is going to go over to the Palestinians. So again, the sheep that are living there, the Jews, the Orthodox community, you're going to be ousted out again. Now, let me just kind of remind you of some things that we see on this. There's more prophecies being fulfilled, friends, and you have no idea about it. I haven't even shared these things with you. How many of you remember this picture right here? Let's see. we got it right here. Prophecy alert. Black Pope to hold masses site on Last Supper in Israel. Orthodox Jews protest. What is going on? Of course, it's back May 13th, 2014. We knew the Pope was coming. This is when they were out there. They were praying. They were crying out to God, saying, don't let the Pope come. Don't let him come to Mount Zion. Because why? The tomb of David sits right up underneath the upper room. And the Pope does come. As we see right here, here he goes. CNN does this video here. The Pope's coming in. He's there at the upper room. And he holds a mass there. Now, I've shared it with you guys many times already before. All right? What is this? This was the fulfillment of Obadiah, where it says in there, they will drink upon thy holy mountain. See? Kika sha shutetim al ha kodeshi. All right? And it's masculine plural. And the Pope only had his communion with men only that day. Trying to reimpersonate Christ. And then, not just is he wearing his little kippah, but he did, takes, puts a crown on his head. What was he doing? He was showing that he was the king of Israel. And you remember John Kerry's nine-month negotiation? Remember how I told you guys back when, this, when he first started this? Maybe like two months after he first announced it? I came on Israeli News Live and I said, that was Rebecca's prophecy. Now, there's ministers out there. They took the things that I said and they come share it to you, but they didn't know the revelation of it. And they said that John Kerry's nine-month negotiation is Rebecca's the two children in the womb. And when they come forth, they're going to have two, it's going to be two nations and it's going to be the Palestinian and a Jewish state. That wasn't the revelation. See, you jumped the gun. You didn't listen to what I said. The real revelation was it's a Vatican state and a Jewish state. The Palestinians, as Daniel says in chapter 11, he comes up strong with a small people. They're blessed as a result. But the real issue there was the Vatican state. Just like you have the Vatican, in, uh, Vatican City as a state within a state. Washington, D.C. is a state within a state. In the British Empire, they have a state within a state. Here will be your new world order state. The church now, the head of the new world order with a United Nations force to guard it. Hmm. Now, what gets me though, when the Pope put on his hat there, do you realize that this was prophecy being fulfilled? Besides Rebecca's prophecy, when she saw in there that there'd be two children, she, had, she, has, she got pregnant. She asked uh, Isaac to pray for her. So she got pregnant. She had twins, Esau and Jacob. And they were wrestling in her womb. And the Lord says, she says to the Lord, why am I thus? See, she didn't have to go to her husband and ask her husband why I was having this. She went to God on her own. Pay attention to that, ministers. And God answered her one-on-one. -on -one. 
And he says, there are two nations in thy womb. And when they come forth, there are two manners of people. There'll be two nations. It was speaking of today. You look at any Orthodox Jew. In fact, two men that I know, Rabbi Winston and Rabbi Tovia Singer, both teach this. And they both teach it because I shared it with them, the information, and they've been, they've been willing to say it to the public. Rabbi Winston published it and, and linked the articles inside of Israeli newspapers after I shared it with him as well, that the Vatican was fulfilling prophecy when they drank upon God's holy mountain. And I said to them, it was about Obadiah. They shared all of this with the world. They shared it with the Jewish world. Now, they, they kind of kept back because they know I believe Yeshua is the Messiah, so they're not going to tell you that they got it from me. But I can show, show you clearly where both of them, I shared it with them both. And I appreciate them. I appreciate their stand. I believe they don't have the eyes to see as of yet, but I believe their eyes might come open before long. Now, here's what's interesting, though. When the Pope did this, and we know that Obadiah clearly says it was Esau that would drink upon that holy mountain, and the Pope fulfilled that prophecy that day. But it also was fulfilling Rebecca's prophecy where the two nations would be born. And so when John Kerry, they, all kinds of articles came out. The nine-month negotiation failed and ended in disaster. There was never no peace. Within less than 30 days after John Kerry's nine-month negotiation ended, Pope Francis, for the first time in history, a Pope came and held a communion service on Mount Zion. That was his reward for a successful nine-month negotiation. They didn't want to tell you that part, though, did they? But here's what's interesting. It's more than just that. You see, there is a, there is a process of redemption, friends. And it's a process of redemption, not just for the house of Judah, but for the house of Israel as well. And I understand many in the house of Israel already believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But also... They may believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but the house of Israel made the same mistake with the house of Judah before they were divided into two houses under Samuel the prophet. We left God when we rejected God's provided way. Now actually, Israel left God even before that. Well, not fully, but when Israel rejected the, not wanting to see God and, and coming down uh, back during uh, on Mount uh, uh, Horeb, when God was going to come down before us all at Mount Sinai. And the people got scared and said, let, let God speak to Moses and not us, lest we all die. So finally God had to come down and tabernacled in a human being so people could accept that. That's why Moses said, the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto me. All right? But when it came to Samuel and the people wanted a king to rule over them, we find that over in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, they wanted a king to rule over them. And God says to Samuel, they've not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. They wanted their king to go do their battles for them, all these things. God was using that secondary method of a prophet to speak to his people. But all 12 tribes of Israel rejected God's provided way and went with a secondary method as a king. This is why we have world politics to this day. This is why you have Donald Trump as your president and the evangelical community put him in there. You're trying to elevate him as King Cyrus. All right, now I'll agree. God says to Cyrus, go build the, the temple. But Cyrus on his cylinder recorded that he served the God of Marduk. Now he obeyed God in rebuilding the temple, but he still was serving Marduk as well on the side. Just like Israel, when they elected Bibi Netanyahu to be king in 1996 and ran through the streets and cried out, Bibi, king of the Jews. And I said to the Israeli stewardess in 1996, I told her, her and her family was visiting in Destin, Florida, and I spoke with them and I said to her, I said, it'll never, it'll never work. And I had no idea what I was going to say to this lady. She says, what do you mean? I said, we rejected God when we rejected God's provided way, Samuel the prophet. I said, and until we ever come back to that place, we'll never get in the sight of God the right way. And she says, what are you talking about? I'm just paraphrasing it. Don't want to spend a long story on it. I said, when we left God, we rejected Samuel the prophet, God's provided way. I said, then what happened? We got a good king. We got David. We got Solomon. 
But Solomon also backslid us, and then eventually we ended up with Ahab. Ahab brought idolatry into Israel, and then finally the temple was destroyed, the house of Israel was sent into exile, the, the temple was destroyed, the house of Judah was sent into exile, and we were scattered to all the earth. I said, that's what our king got us. I said, but if you'll notice, we're on that return road of redemption. I said, we've been scattered, but now we're gathered. We're back in the homeland, correct? She said, that's true. I said, do we not take, as a Jewish people, leave a door open for Eliyahu, which means Elijah? She said, yes. I said, we leave the cup out for him, don't we? She said, yes. By the way, that cup's significant too. You have to read the book to know all about that. But we leave the cup for Elijah, saying is in our tradition that we are willing to accept the prophet once again. I said, now, therefore, the king must fail, as he did in the case of Ahab. I said, as good as prime minister, nothing else may be as a good king. I said, I don't say that he's not going to be a good prime minister. I said, but he will have to fail because it's not God's provided way. I said, and when he fails, then we will cry out for Elijah. And God has promised to send Elijah. Now, I didn't tell her about Jesus saying that truly Elijah shall first come and restore all things, which most Christians say, no, Jesus restored all things. Sure he did. I agree with that. But since then, you have what? Uh, I think 9.8 thousand denominations. Is that a restoration of all things in this day? No, Jesus knew that all these denominations would cause so much confusion, so much division among the people that he had to send Elijah to not only help the Jews, but also straighten out the Christians. So you need to get ready for it yourself. Because why? Many Christians are descendants of the house of Israel. And like the Jews, we too have to go back the same way we left God. Now the house of Israel believed Yeshua when he came. When Yeshua came, we did. We believed him. We see in the scriptures that they were believing that Yeshua, that many of them, I think it's recorded in John chapter 4. They brought him from Syria, descendants of the house of Israel. Remember Jesus commanded his apostles to go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what happened? Nicaea Rome, we rejected him. Descendants of the house of Israel, as well as descendants of the house of Judah, rejected Yeshua from being our king over us, and now we put a pope in his place. Now, not all of them did. I realize that. But we put a pope in the place. And it came down. Finally, there was the Reformation. You got Martin Luther. Then you had John Wesley. You had Calvin, Finney, Knox, Moody, all these different men of God. You know, and every one of them played their part. I'm not speaking anything against these, these great revivals that we've had in this last day. But it's still not the restoration of the word. You've got to go back. You've got to have Elijah. And I believe your two witnesses is when that will be fulfilled. But here's what's interesting. I want to share with you a scripture here in 1 Samuel. After God talks to them about what they're going to get. All right? Let's look at all of it. He says, He will take your daughters to be perfumers and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards and even the best of them and give them to his servants. Well, you know, they did exactly that. You know where that's fulfilled at? When the Vatican give to the Palestinians that little beautiful olive garden there on the Mount of Olives where they put the Church of All Nations there and the Palestinians are the custodians of that particular location because the Palestinians, I hate to say it, Palestinian friends, I love you, I really do, but you are servants to the Pope of Rome. He give you the finest, finest olive garden in all Israel where there's two trees that are 2,000 years old where Jesus prayed under. Think about that. And he will take the tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. Officers and servants? Sure. Your taxes in the United States go to the royal crown. The royal crown gives their tenth right over to the papacy. Yes. Don't forget over here, okay? So we get, I don't want, don't want you to forget what we're talking about here, right? See, the hireling will not warn you about the wolf, all right? Just remember who the wolf is. Rumulus and Remus, founders of Rome, the Vatican, 
having the emblem in there. See, they won't tell you about that. Because a hireling is too scared to tell you that Rome is taking over Jerusalem. I guess it's not politically correct. Maybe they might lose their income. Maybe their 501c would be taken away from them and they have to pay taxes on all of it. No, pay your taxes now. All right, just pay it now. All right? Anyway. And he will take a tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give them to his officers. He will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to, put them to his work. Sure does. He will take a tenth of your flocks. There's your tithes. Now I realize that Malachi speaks about tithes. I'm not condemning what the word of God does speak about. But he says he will take the tenth of your flocks. God doesn't take anything. You see? It's of a free willing heart that you give of your tithing offering. You don't have, with God he doesn't take, but this guy takes it. Now here's where, the, here's where the prophecy got fulfilled also during the time when the Pope got ready to visit. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king whom you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. You shall cry out in that day, and the Lord thy God will not answer you. I want you to be able to see it for yourself. Now this is the house of Israel remnants of the house of, excuse me, the house of Judah, the Orthodox community. They're crying out on the Temple Mount as the man called Pope Francis is getting ready within two weeks after this picture was taken, would come and uh, would step up to the upper room and sit and put a crown upon his head and sit as king of Israel. And I say, not only did the Israeli government permit this, but the Christian church permitted it as well. And instead of allowing Christ to be king, we've placed a man in that position. And God said that you would cry out in that day, and God would not hear you. Why? When you reject the king, when you quit being a hireling, when you quit ministers, let me say something to you ministers, I love you, but let me tell you something, brothers. When you quit being a hireling, quit, quit standing out there preaching just so somebody will pay you to do it and stand for the truth of the word of God and warn the sheep about the wolf that's coming. When you'll stand up there to do that, then God will bless you. And no, it may not be with your new Cadillac or whatever else you want to drive. I'm not saying what you do or what you don't do. But the thing is, is stop being a hireling. Stand up for the truth. Let the people know who the wolf is. Because they're coming to scatter the sheep again like they did in 70 AD. And this is our one time, this is our one chance to stand for what's truth. Let me just kind of share with you. I want to jump back over here. I'll go to the images because I said he had the crown on his head there. Let me show you the picture here. Here it is right here. And I don't know how big I can make this here on the screen for you guys there. I'll try to get it up there. But if you can notice here, the Pope, you know, I don't think they consider that the actual crowns. I know that there's a fancier crown that he has. But he takes and he puts on that fish god hat that he's wearing there. See? And that's what he did in the upper room that day. So he, is, he did become the king. He's been placed in that position. Prime Minister Netanyahu, he was a king for a season. And maybe that was done for a reason. I'm not really sure why they did that. But uh, who knows? But anyway, I'm Stephen Vernon. I'm, I just had to share these things with you. There's more that I could say to you. Uh, a lot of this is actually in the book that I'm writing now. But it goes much deeper into these areas there. So I know it's going to be a blessing to you. Pray for me about writing this, that the Lord will continue to lead me. He's revealing things to me faster than I've ever had in my entire life. I, I cannot even keep up with the revelations. They're coming so fast. Those of you that have joined us on live stream, I trust it's been a blessing to you. I'm not able to see the comments, but I, I trust it's a blessing for you as well. God bless you, uh, and we thank you for watching.